Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to all as we gather here for an enlightening leadership lecture series. We are excited to have you join us for this amazing lecture that promises insights and inspiration. We are thrilled to have Mr. Anu Ratninde with us today. As the president of Johnson Controls for the Asia Pacific region, Mr. Ratninde is at the forefront of the company's growth strategy in the Asia Pacific and China. With a background that spans the globe, he has served as president of the electrical distribution systems and advanced safety and user experiences for Aptiv, overseeing thousands of engineers, over 20 manufacturing plants, and 35,000 people. His academic journey is equally impressive. With a PhD in complexity leadership, an MBA from Indiana University, and master degrees from Thunderbird School of Global Management, the National University of Singapore. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. So ladies and gentlemen, with great honor, let us all welcome our speaker, Mr. Anu Ratninde. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I saw the title today is, uh, can you hear me okay in the microphone? Okay, good. Uh, title today is Navigating the Future. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the mega trends in Asia Pacific, and then we talk a little bit about what uh, Johnson Controls is doing. And then finally, I think I hopefully I can leave you with a couple of thoughts as you, as you learn and, uh, and, and, and get ready to take over the world as big leaders one day, and I'm, I'm sure you all will be. So hopefully you will remember this uh, with a couple of thoughts that I can, I can leave you with. Uh, so, so there is, there's, if you talk to everyone, you say India is growing, China is growing, a lot of opportunities, and, and they're going to be bigger than the uh, bigger than rest of the world. But, but if you really look at the, the history, that at least if you, if you take back uh, the, the 2,000 years uh, of history, uh, Asia always has been the largest, largest region. Asia, I mean, 2,000 years ago, Asia Pacific was about 60% uh, of, uh, of the world in, in terms of GDP. And it has been like that. It has been like that, except for a short period of time, which was troubled by the wars, World War I, World War II, troubled by the war, it lost its position. So, so, so that's, that's very important to realize that Asia Pacific is not becoming the largest region. Is Asia Pacific is regaining the position that what it used to be? I think it's it's very important that every time I speak to leaders in Asia Pacific and and, and a young uh, generations are going to be the future leaders. I always remind them the importance of remembering the thousands of years of history and the heritage that we have, preserving it, because that history is going to get repeated. So we should be prepared. Uh, and 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 not not only that, uh, with with what is happening today, and 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 looking at any indicator in terms of uh, consumption, on the on the material, in terms of consumption on, uh, on 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 industrial goods, and in terms of consumption on other durable items, so Asia Pacific is consuming uh, in in a very large numbers today. So it has become a consumption market. So, so in, if, if you look at the Asia Pacific and, and this uh, IGBC going on and, and, and looking at how to green the buildings and, and how to support the green growth in India, uh, and, and there is still a lot of people willing to, well, wanting to come to urban, area, urban cities. So in Asia, in, Asia Pacific, in, in Asia Pacific, the urban population was roughly about 250 million in 1950. 250 million in 1950, and today it is about 2.5 billion. And there's going to be another 1.5 billion or so going to get added over the next uh, uh, 20, 30 years. So what it means is with this urbanization going on, of course there are more requirements to make sure that there's, there's land limitations, there's a, a public funding limitation, and how do we support uh, them and so on. But at the same time, it's, it's going to be a major economic growth engine as well. So, so even, even here in India, 
there has to be about close to a trillion dollar investment that need to happen to, to take these people that are going to come to cities from, from villages. So, so it, all in all, and when you look at on the, on the technology front, technology front, and with every indicator that you look at, whether it is on a, on a 5G base stations, subscribers, AI publications, research, Asia Pacific is leading in every single indicator. Area, Asia Pacific is leading in every single indicator. But there is also a major challenge. There is also a major challenge. If you look at the uh, energy transition, that we have been depending too much on oil and gas and coal. And if you look at the India, 83% of the oil and gas is imported. And the coal, the existing coal, probably enough for another 150 years or so. And China is even a much shorter time. So what does that mean is the coal is going to run away and the dependency on others is high for the oil and gas for a longer period of time. So yes, sustainability, green energy is required to make the world green, but much more importantly, it is required to keep the countries running. Because, because your coal is running out and the energy dependency is much higher. We have seen what happened, what happened after, after the war in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine. So there were, there were fuel, fuel shortages in, in Europe. So when, when some restrictions did happen. So there is, there is a, there's a major challenge. I mean, you have your dependency on, on oil and gas import. So, so with this alone has a major drive to develop the energy transition. Energy transition is going to be, on one hand, we need to make sure we consume less so we can use for a longer period of time. But on the other hand, we need to, we, you can use the technology so that we have high efficient products that is consuming less energy. But on the other hand, we're changing our usage patterns. We discussed today earlier in, in IGBC, uh, when you go to some hotel rooms, your temperature is set to 19 degrees. And sometimes they don't even have a key card to turn on the air conditioner. They were on all day long, even if you check in at 6 p.m. at night. The, if the, so do we have to cool to that level? Can we, set, can we get used to room temperature of 25 degrees? In, in a heavy winter, do we have to heat it up to 25 degrees? Can we heat it up to 19 degrees? So there is a level of usage pattern that need to happen on the public, but at the same time, technology need to be developed and used to make sure that, that we still provide the level of comfort that is required for humans. And then on top of that, the renewable energy transition that need to happen. So there is an, there's some major drivers to, to make sure that uh, these transition, these drivers do happen to make sure this energy transition is taking place. And, and, and also, we, everyone talking about geopolitical situations, the supply chain disruptions that we all witnessed during the COVID-19 time, and as well as in the previous uh, other situations and, and, and a cost and so on. So the localization continue to going to happen. And, and uh, here in India with the Made in India uh, strategy, there is so much drive for localization. But companies cannot just go and localize because it, you, you can't be reinventing every time unless you have the scale that is necessary. How, do you, how does companies preserve what is required to maintain the global standards and the scale so that you benefit from the technology uh, for the investments that companies make to develop the technologies, but at the same time you localize so that you benefit from that. So that trend on, on a, on a, on a, uh, a globalization will, will continue to happen as well. And their companies are very successful in doing that. So what, did, what does Johnson Controls do? Johnson Controls is a company 140 years old. It was invented by a Professor Warren Johnson, just in, a, in teaching in a, in a classroom like this. 
and he wanted to adjust the temperature in the classroom. So he had no way to adjust, so he invented the thermostat himself in Wisconsin, uh, United States. And, there, and after that, he invented the company called Johnson Controls. It's 140 years old. And, and from that point until today, Johnson Controls has been in building technology. Today, when we talk about sustainability, decarbonization, net zero, 40% of carbon emissions are coming from the buildings. And in India, in, in cities, that number could be about 60%. So carbon emissions coming from the, from the building. And, and in buildings, and including your home, and including this building, the different equipments are provided by different suppliers. Whether it is a track system, whether it's a fire control, security, elevators, those these systems are supplied by different players, and they don't talk with each other. So if they don't talk with each other, they are not connected with each other, you're not achieving the most optimum conditions. So making buildings smarter, healthier, more sustainable requires more digital platforms that you can connect these devices together. So that requires, again, we are solving the problem of, of sustainability. We are solving the problem of decarbonization and achieving net zero. So it's a trifactor. Three things that need to happen. First, you need to have high energy efficient equipments. So, so we need to upgrade the equipments with the high efficiency that you consume less energy. And number two, you need to have electrification. So you connect these devices with IoT so that you collect data. So you, you collect data. And then you, you have digitalization and AI and MI, uh, ML and, and, and models that you can ultimately create autonomous buildings. So it's interesting that, that in the United States, there were many companies spent so much money, did so much research to drive autonomous cars, the car without a driver, from east coast to west coast and back. They spent probably hundreds of millions of dollars in research doing that. And that's, that's a tough thing to do. Getting these cars drive at 70, 80 miles per hour and going on, on, on a freeway and, and putting lives there, making sure they're safe without driver, that's a very tough thing to do. It requires so much technology and, and redundancies and, and, and so on to make that happen. But if you look at buildings, if you forgot to turn on the air conditioner this morning, it is still running when you go back. But we forgot to invest on that technology. We went and did very difficult ones, but there were very easy ones that we did not pay attention to. So today, buildings are getting so much attention because of the amount of energy that it consumes and the amount of carbon that it emits. So as a result, because the technology is available, that's a good thing when it comes to buildings. There is no shortage of technology. You don't need to have a very disruptive technologies coming up. So technologies are available, but it is a question of embracing and making it work. That's why in Johnson Controls, now we, our, our role is to make buildings smarter, healthier, and, and more sustainable. So smart buildings uh, are, the, are the buildings that, that, uh, that, that can think and respond by itself, like, like an autonomous building, and healthy buildings. I think we all experienced during during COVID-19, the importance of having healthy buildings. In, uh, in, the, in, the, in the report suggests that 1% improvement in air quality will have a significant impact on your financial report. First, the healthy buildings will make people more productive. If people are more productive and you get more output. So, so that's a very important area that, that, that people are demanding now to make sure that they get the right level of uh, air quality and, uh, and, and, and humidity and temperature that is required. And, and more importantly, the sustainability, sustainability as well. When it comes to, uh, uh, when it come to ESG and, uh, and, 
and uh, net zero, that there's so much work uh, that need to happen in the building space as well. And what we do in Johnson Controls is like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this is probably everything that we do, we, we put it in, uh, in, in a one page, that we do have uh, the domains that is required, whether it's an HVAC uh, control, fire security domain, and then, then, then you have the sensors, uh, with the, you measuring the, the occupancy, uh, pressure, temperature, uh, and, and so on, the sensors. And then we connect all that into our platform called OpenBlue. OpenBlue is a platform that, that you can connect to devices, and then you can collect data, and you can analyze, and ultimately, you can give an outcome. Ultimately, you can give an outcome. I think it's, it's no longer uh, companies have to go and say, hey, can you give me a, a chiller? Can you give me an air conditioner? Instead, you can say, hey, this is the air quality I need. This is the type of cooling I need. This is the level of services I need. So it's a more of an outcome-based uh, solution uh, instead, of, instead of buying an, buying an equipment, for example. So, so that's the holistic approach of uh, what, what Johnson Controls is doing to truly uh, not, only, not only help uh, customers achieving uh, their, their, their healthy buildings, but also solving the net zero equation as well. And, and uh, like I said, uh, it's, uh, it's a 140-year-old company. Uh, it's a uh, $25 billion, $25 billion company with uh, over 100,000 people working around the world. So in Asia Pacific, uh, we have about 21 manufacturing plants, uh, about 25,000 people. And, 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 and with, the, with that short introduction of Johnson Controls, I think what I'd what I really like to talk to, and then hopefully we get into uh, discussions as well, is, is what truly we can do now. Right? I think we mentioned earlier that Asia Pacific is the place to be. Asia Pacific is the place to be. It was the world's uh, largest uh, uh, region uh, in terms of economy. And, and as well as uh, so many things were invented here when it comes to mathematics and chemistry and, uh, and, and physics. There's so many things invented in this region as well. And it was a powerhouse of the world, but we lost that position uh, for a period of time and it is regaining. And, uh, and on top of that, we have to solve the, the sustainability equation. Because if you do not solve the sustainability equation, I am sure future generations are going to wake up one day and going to hold us accountable that we did not do the right thing. So we have that responsibility as well. So how do we get there? How do we get there? So it's, uh, it's, uh, I, th I think I, I, I take uh, two quotes uh, from Peter Drucker here that, that again, it's it's not about it's not about just the science or art. I think it's it's about the experience. It's it's really about that practice that we need to get into. It is really about the practice we need to get into. And 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 if you look at, I mean, one one of the one of the greatest leaders, uh, um, you you can do many things with uh, with the governance and power. So and if you do the right thing, I'm going to reward you. If you do the wrong thing, I'm going to punish you. But it's, there's so much problems with that model. But if the people are motivated by their true value system, that is much more powerful. Mahatma Gandhi proved that here in India. It is not about the military power. It is, not, it, it is about what gets motivated. What is, that, is, that is truly, it, it, it's, it's about your internal value system, uh, uh, the power that can, that can get motivated. So, so, so one of the things that I, I always uh, share uh, with, with every time I speak to is that uh, we created this SILA model to, to explain that what needs to happen uh, to, to get through this transition. So as you can see on the outer ring, I put there the systems thinker. I think, I think we, can, we can explain the system thinking in a, in a very different way, uh, including the most fundamental things about, uh, about everything is interconnected. So, so um, uh, and, and then how, how the emergence uh, type of properties happen and, and how these different mindsets forms and how, how different uh, uh, situations that, that can occur in a, in a, in a complex city science. Uh, but I mean, I mean, just think of, for example, that, um, uh, that, that, that in a university, for example, I mean, can the teachers be successful if the university, if the students are not successful? 
right? Can the students be successful if the university is not successful? Can they be successful without parents being successful? How about the security guard? How about the cleaner? How about the cafeteria owner? How about the government? So, so everyone in the ecosystem got to be successful. There is no way that one alone can be successful. That, that ability of thinking, I think if you look at many leaders today, I mean, you're embracing that. Can, can a leader be successful without the organization being successful, without everyone in the, in the, in the uh, uh, ecosystem being successful? I think that level of systems thinking is extremely important for, for le leaders to move forward. And then we talk about internalized. I mean, it, it's, truly, it's truly about getting into the value system getting into the value system. I mean, we shouldn't be doing the right thing. That's because if you do the wrong thing, we go to jail. Therefore, we will do the right thing. I mean, that's not sustainable because that's you're driven by the fear. You're not driven by your value system. So, so when you internalize something, it becomes your natural habit and how you do that. And then it's very important, the, the interact. I think one of the things that that I always uh, discuss is had uh, a great discussion earlier with uh, 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 Professor Mahalingam and, and, and others. And it's, it's, so, it's, it's so much that we learn. When I interact with you, uh, uh, there is so much I learn. That we interact with my people. There's so much. I mean, I spend uh, the day on, on uh, Wednesday in uh, Delhi, and I was uh, in uh, Mumbai uh, yesterday, and here in Chennai today. And I, I, I met so many industry leaders, uh, CEOs, and and my own uh, engineers and, and sales leaders and, 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 and frontline uh, technicians and project managers, so much of that I, I, I learned. And, and how do we learn, make this learning to adapt? As in, it's, it's, it's about myself. Leadership is never about managing others. Leadership is always about managing yourself. So, so here is another concept that, that I, I, I always share that, um, uh, that uh, the leaders fundamentally, you, you can see sometimes organizations, we have good results, positive results, and sometimes we have negative results, and, and bad things do happen, and, and lead, leaders get into trouble. But, but what, how leaders manage is leaders ultimately, uh, leaders' behavior, little things that leaders do, that, that create mental models or mindsets in the organization. So mindsets in the organization. And that mindsets lead to the systematic structures. That's what organization charts and, uh, and standard operating procedures and, uh, and, 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 and uh, rules and so on coming up. Those are just structures. Those structures are created by the mental models, and that creates certain patterns in the organization, and that creates ultimate outcome. So when I explain this one, I, I always use an example. And uh, when I started on a new job once, uh, I usually go to office at 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm in the office. And, and, and I see the, the trash can is not clean. So my trash can is not clean. And, uh, and, and I have been go always going to office at 6 o'clock in the morning in, in, in my previous uh, company. And, and it's always clean. By the time 6 o'clock, I go in. But that day, it was not clean on, on, the, on the new job. So I was trying to test my model. I, I want to test how this works. And if I tell it to my secretary or my HR leader or admin leader, it will be done immediately. But I decided not to tell. And I decided how long before people notice it and it had to happen. So one week, uh, first day didn't happen, second day didn't happen, five days gone, didn't happen, right? One week over, next day, Monday, is still there, Tuesday is still there. And Wednesday, it's clean. And from that point onwards, it's clean every day. It's clean every day. So what happened? Actually, later I find out what happened. So, so, the, so the, the cleaner thought, this new guy is only first day coming early. So maybe it's just a day one. But then later he thought, to one, maybe only two days, maybe only one week. Then she realized, no. It's not going to work with this one. So I clean. Because my predecessor used to go to office at 9.30 in the morning. My predecessor used to go to office at 9.30 in the morning. So ad they adjust the shift hours so that they can come at 8 o'clock and clean. 
right? So what happened is my behavior or my predecessor's behavior created a mindset in the organization. That mindset is what created the, the shift, working hours for workers. And that's what is creating the patterns, and that's what creating why. Because, so this, is, this can be applicable not just on a little things like that. Every single thing that we do, we can talk about sustainability, we can talk about net zero, but everything that we do does matter how we transform organization. So to, I talk about self-leadership. Uh, self-leadership. If, if there is a manual for leadership, it, it's going to be all about self-leadership. I mean, if, if, you, if you can't manage yourself, there is no business in managing others. So it's, it's ultimately, it is, it is all about ha having the right mindset and, and, and a self-discipline and, and having a good value system, it comes down. So if leaders are motivated by um, money, power, and being famous, we are going to suffer big time. Because none of these matter when you are in leadership positions. When you are in leadership positions, it's all about how to get things done. Because leaders are going to be under tremendous pressure because you're going to be, you, you won't be able to handle the pressure if that's what motivates you. So, so of course, there is money for leaders, right? Of course, leaders are famous, but a lot of leaders probably will say, I wish I'm not that famous because uh, I, I don't have to, uh, you know, I can live my private life. Right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and the same thing with the power, but a lot of leaders will tell you they actually do not have power. Because the decisions that they take, it sounds like they have power, but they have to live with the consequences of those decisions. They're always thinking whether that decision is right or wrong. So, so ultimately, uh, it, it, it can't be. Leaders cannot be motivated by money, uh, power, or, or the fame. Leaders must be motivated by what is your true goal in life? What is your real goal in life? What do you really want to achieve? What do you want to leave behind? Because we're all going to, we all, if you're lucky, we're all going to get old and sick and die. If you're not lucky, we're going to get, die before we get old. Right? So, so what, what is our real goal? It is it's extremely important that, that we're motivated by a value system and that we discipline ourselves to manage ourselves and that ultimately showing in our day-to-day -day actions that we do. Day-to-day -day actions we do, and that's what ultimately leading to develop uh, good habits. Leading to, uh, so you, you can see many organizations, people struggle to, uh, to, to come to meetings on time. People struggle to do, maybe do the homework on time. People, people struggle to, to, to get their uh, simple things done. If you can't get those simple things done, you definitely can't get the big things done. You definitely can't get the big things done. So developing that good habit is extremely important. So, so lastly, I also want to speak to you about, about what, what, is, what is the right thing. So I'm sure all of you learned so many things from your parents and especially your grandparents. Some, some stories uh, uh, about, about 5,000 years old, maybe 3,000 years old, 2,000 years old. And they remain in our mind as, as the stories, grandmother stories. But there's so much wisdom worth it. There is so much ancient Asian wisdom worth it. And then on the other hand, there's modern science coming up. Modern science coming up and, and showing a showing lot of uh, 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 statistical models and, and, and certain concepts that, that, that work. We need to do that. And then the ancient wisdom suggests that we do maybe something different. Is, is, there a, is there a convergence on this? Is there a convergence on this? When leaders manage organizations, I, I think uh, in, in uh, uh, there, there was a book uh, called uh, uh, The Scientific Management, The Principles of Scientific Management by, by Frederick Taylor, uh, where he basically said uh, organizations are like machines. By pulling the right lever, you get the, the certain outcome, and it consistently does happen because organizations are basically machines. But, but that is totally not the concept on the ancient wisdom. Ancient wisdom taught to treat how to treat people like people. 
people like human, and, and, the, and, 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 and that, was, that was a very different concept. But, but if you look at today, in a, in a, in a business schools, so even in, in the United States, uh, uh, many uh, 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 leading business schools, uh, what do they teach? They teach uh, uh, meditation, they teach yoga, they teach mindfulness. Where do they come from? Where do they come from? I was, I was in the United States uh, last week, and, uh, and then I, I checked into checked into hotel, and, and at, the, uh, at, the, at the reception counter, there were mindfulness cards. So I can take those mind, mindfulness cards, and, and, and I, can, I can play with them, because that helps in the mindfulness. I'm like, where do you get them? Right? So you can see the value of the ancient wisdom is being recognized e even in the modern Western world. But sometimes here in Asia, we tend to forget about them. We tend to forget about them. So, so there is a convergence about, about, about the, the modern science and the wisdom, ancient wisdom. And there's a recognition and realization about there is something called mind. Something called mind. And if this mind has, is, is motivated by bad things, bad things going to happen. So therefore, our job is to have, have our mind motivated by the right thing so that we can have a better sleep to begin with. And then our actions are going to be uh, leading to do good things. So it has been said by many ancient leaders, and all, all these are over, uh, uh, over 2,500 years old. For example, Buddha said in the Dasaraja Dharma that what are the 10 things that leaders should follow? And Confucius in China said, uh, if the prince's personal conduct is good, uh, his government is effective without giving the orders. If the prince is bad, it doesn't matter what rule and what police you're going to hire, people will do bad things. So, so the way for country to run is the prince to be good. Right? Isn't that related to the iceberg model that we saw earlier? The leader's conduct is creating a mindset that ultimately leading to positive things. Right? And in the, the Art of War, probably the oldest leadership book in the world by Sun Tzu said leaders must held accountable to get things done. So, so ultimately what we are seeing and, and, and even, even what, we, what we see what, what the, the recent uh, Western leaders as well, the realization of the value system, realization of importance of leaders' behavior. So, so I, I want to leave you with one thought that as, as many of you uh, are going to be in, uh, I mean, if, if, if you look at IIT alumni, and that's a good uh, prediction where you're going to be in uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, you're going to be in a very leading positions, right? But at the same time, you will be leading a world which is very different than today, right? And it is just like the world today. It's, uh, it's very different than uh, when we went to college about uh, 20, 30 years ago. So, but, but, but the fundamentals doesn't change much about the human value. So it's so important that, that we preserve our value system and we, 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 so that we can uh, navigate through any uncertain environment. So, so Peter Drucker said the best way to predict the future is to create it. So what future that we're talking about is ourself. So being ourself, the right person that we need to be. And that is going to be helpful in navigating no matter what challenge we're navigating, whether it's an economic problem, company problem, technical problem we are solving. Uh, it doesn't matter. As long as we are prepared for it, we will over overcome that. So I hope you find that uh, useful, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Sarjit, and I'm in, in my current fourth year. And thanks for giving such an insightful talk. So, 
Uh, I just want to ask you a question on the other side. At, as you by giving an example, you mentioned uh, I have a habit of coming up early and then it uh, influences other people to change the model. But I also think not every person is perfect. There will be some bad habit that leader will also have. So how he should make sure that that bad habit does not uh, propagate in organization. So, yeah. Wisdom, and then I'll come to answer the specific question. So again, one of the one of the ancient leaders that I mentioned, Sun Tzu, in Art of War, two thousand seven hundred years ago, he said, "If you know yourself and your enemy, you need not worry hundred battles." So I mean, so in a very simple way, he said, "If you want to win, you you need you only two things: know yourself and know your enemy." Which one is harder? I mean, the, the answer question is, do you know yourself? Right? So it's a, it's a, it, that, that, that's the key point, right? Because many of us believe, think we know ourselves. Uh, you know, the, the, some business schools invented SWOT analysis. Right? What is SWOT analysis? Strength and weakness of whom? Yourself. Opportunities and threat of whom? The others. So we don't understand that know yourself and know others concept, which is like an old grandmother story. But when you do SWOT analysis, we know what we're talking about. But the question is, you know how to fill that two by two matrix, but do you really know what it is? So to your question about if you have a bad habit, I think many of the time, I think it's a, it's a dopamine in the brain will tell you that you're always right, even when you are wrong. So. Knowing yourself will help you identify your weaknesses. Knowing yourself. I think I had uh, the, the example that you mentioned about coming on time to a meeting. I think, imagine a situation where you go to a meeting, people don't come to the meeting. Right? People, people just don't show up in the meeting. I think if you, if you start thinking, analyzing that problem, you probably realize the reason why people don't come to a meeting on time is because you don't come on time. Or you don't start on time. You have a habit of not coming, one day come, other day don't come. People are confused. Should I come early or not? Should I come on time or not? Or even if you come, hey, let's wait for others. But if you continue to go on time, you start on time, I guarantee everyone will be on time after three, four times. So, but it requires you to realize that was your weakness is what led to people not coming on time. So, yes, there are bad habits, but that bad habits, correcting that bad habits is what the, uh, 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 the self-leadership is. I mean, if you look at that SILA model that I went through, that's a continuous model. System thinking, internalize, uh, interact, learn, and adapt, right? What you learn there. Is, is because of you, others don't come on time. Then you adapt. What you, what you adapt is that you start coming on time. And then keep the model going. Maybe next time you learn something else. It's exactly, it's all about giving away the bad habits and bringing in the good habits. Thank you, First of all, thank you for this wonderful lecture about e-system and value systems. I'm a faculty in IIT Madras, and I'm about to retire in one year's time. So I'm going to ruffle a lot of the feathers of my students. <laughs> so in the 30 years, I was a student here, and I was being a faculty for 30 years now. What I have seen is a big drop in ethical values of students, especially. Do apologies if I'm hurting my students. <laughs> but that is what I see. For example, cheating in exams. For example, assignments. They don't actually submit. They don't do all the things on their own. They always copy and submit. So I've seen this, and I don't know whether among my faculty colleagues I see unethical behavior at all. I, I let my fellow students actually comment on it. I don't want. I don't, don't believe in the leadership, which actually I've seen. I don't see that we set values. We are very proud of it. You don't see many of our IIT and factory say they plagiarize. We are very ethical about the way we do things. So why is it this, we are not able to influence our students? What is missing? Is there something that we should be doing besides just simply practicing 
that you know value system. Oh, that's. I think it's very important because uh, being a faculty member, I have always retired. I'm just uh, trying to understand whether what 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 went wrong. I I think I think that's that's an excellent question. So I probably will use another example to to come in to give a little bit thought on that. Um, I I mean I. I mean, I, I, I read somewhere that in the United States, uh, there was a research went on uh, when the young adults go to jail, when they come out, come back, uh, there was a question asked that, is there one thing that could have prevented you from going to jail? The one thing that could have prevented. And uh, with, with, the, with the large majority said, I wish my parents were tough when I did the little things wrong. Because my parents accepted when I did little things wrong, and then I started doing bigger things wrong, bigger things wrong, bigger things wrong, until I end up in the jail. I think, I think it is required. You know, in a, in a leadership, I always say there are three things that is required. You need to have a good brain. You need to have a good heart, but you got to have guts. So I think, I think punishing students for copying and not submitting homework on time, that's the duty. That's our duty. I don't think that we should ever, uh, I mean, students, we are making students better people by doing that. I, I think you're right that, that certain, certain times, because, because it, there is no way, I mean, even on the example that they're coming to meeting on time, I mean, there could be some people still can't do that. Maybe they don't belong there. They don't belong there, but you got to take that tough decisions. So that's how I feel that uh, more we tolerate the wrong things, uh, it is considered as an acceptance. I hope that gives some thought. Right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I think after professor's uh, question, no one is there to ask a question, I think. <laughs> okay, otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate, really enjoyable, and hopefully I uh, was able to leave you with a couple of thoughts that's uh, going to be helpful as, uh, as you move on with your life and career. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anu Ratninte, for uh, a wonderful evening, a very insightful session where you touched upon a lot of fundamental things about leadership and you know, various relevant uh, you know, aspects that one should really pay attention to. Thank you to Shankar Ayer for enabling this and making this happen, and to the entire leadership team from Johnson Control who has graced the occasion with their presence. Uh, thank you, of course, to Professor Ashwin also, who is who has also attended the session, and of course, to Professor Shankar Narasimhan and to the IIT Madras community. On behalf of IIT Madras community, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to you for your wonderful session this evening. We would also like to honor you with a small memento session, if you could also come. I would request everyone to stay back for a picture. Thank <laughs> you.
Şimdi o değil. Thank <laughs> you. 